live from Sister Baseball Studio. Urban Teachers Lounge is a platform for bridging the gap between educational scholarship and classroom teachers. Voices will include teachers, administrators, educational scholars, community members, and activists. Hey, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Urban Teachers Lounge. I am your host, G. Fumilayo DeVoe. This podcast is unapologetically for black teachers, unapologetically by black teachers. The purpose of the program is to bridge the gap between educational scholarship and classroom teachers. This week, will I will be discussing a phenomenal um, uh, event that I went to last week with Dr. Vanessa Siddle Walker, a professor at uh, Emory University. So grab your coffee because I'm going to tell you how fabulous um, this event was. Go on and grab your coffee and let's get talking. And I hope you have your coffee. I do have some good coffee right now. Um, first, I do want to apologize to my listeners because Thursday is the official drop day. Um, every Thursday um, at 6 a.m., I had some technical difficulties. I had a family situation to come up as well as my computer and recording and blah, blah. Um, so that just to let you know that I am a human um, but I'm working on it, so please bear with me as I'm doing the, the recording and so on for this program. I first want to start with Dr. Vanessa Siddle Walker. Oh my God, a fabulous scholar, a fabulous researcher, and a fabulous, phenomenal uh, storyteller. So I went to, I live in Atlanta for those of you that are uh, don't know. I live in Atlanta. Uh, we have the Auburn Avenue Research Library, and it's a place where African American research and writing and culture is definitely preserved. They also um, provide a lot of um, they provide a lot of programming around um, books and research and authors and events. Um, throughout the year. So it's not just, of course, because it's Black History Month, they do this all year long. So definitely shout out to the Auburn Avenue Research Library. So this particular day, last it was last Sunday actually, I went to see Vanessa Siddle Walker. Um, she, was gonna, she was speaking about her latest book, The Lost Education of Horace Tate. And it was originally supposed to be a lecture and book signing. However, they changed it, um, which was probably better because I like I like more of an interaction uh, interactive lecture type. So they changed it to um, Dr. Walker speaking with her literary agent, um, Miss Janelle uh, Walden Ogman. I think I'm saying her name right. And the interaction was. Oh my goodness. First of all, Dr. Walker is a wonderful storyteller. So you're already engaged with the material that she has and you're also engaged with how she's telling the story. So I want to tell, and I will definitely leave this information at the bottom of the podcast. The name of the book is The Lost Education of Horace Tate. Dr. Walker is a professor of African-American educational studies at Emory University here in Atlanta. Um, she's been doing this work for well over 30 years. Um, I believe this project of the, the book, the research that was entailed in this was a, almost a 20 year event. Um, and it was very encouraging as a, a junior, I would say myself, a, a junior scholar. It was very encouraging to see someone who's been in this work for so long, the diligence, the perseverance, and the honesty of how it went, um, how she uh, processed through this entire event, the good and the bad, or not even bad, but the emotional pieces 
and I'm going to do an entire podcast on um, the grief of research, meaning the more I find out histories and documents that whether they're true or not true, having to analyze and process this information is very difficult. So I want to say how appreciative um, I was with her journey through this process of creating this book. Um, so I'm going to start with Horace Tate. We need to have a, a little background on Horace Tate. Horace Tate was the first African American to earn a PhD at the University of Kentucky. Um, he was the first African American to run for mayor in Atlanta, the first executive director of Georgia Association of Education, which is the highlight of where we are. Um, he was executive secretary and chief executive of the newly integrated GTEA, which was the Georgia Teachers and Education Association. So the, the significance of Horace Tate is, is simple. Before uh, Brown versus Board, we had black teachers unions, black teachers organizations, um, and white teachers organizations. Um, and it was segregated, and part of the segregation, of course, was because of Jim Crow. But the other thing is, a lot of, of what we have to acknowledge is the white teachers organizations were not necessarily looking out for the interest of black teachers organizations. And there were some situations that were happening for black educators that we needed to, um, to voice. So it, it was very helpful to have a black organization. Um, I know that, that there's, you know, segregation has, has a, it's a problem in America and we have to deal with racism and we have to deal with institutionalized racism and we have to deal with oppressive acts and oppressive and, and exclusion, exclusionary acts. But we also have to acknowledge the reason and the purpose for blacks or black people or African American people to have organizations is to make sure that our interests are being um, addressed, are served, um, our advocacy is necessary uh, wholeheartedly, not just, you know, oh, we're going to put it on the docket that we're going to talk about black education and then we're going to move forward. No. And so that therein lies the problem even today. Um, it, it's not that we don't want to have um, allies, but I think a lot of times, and this is a whole nother conversation that I don't want to go off on a tangent on, but we have to understand that there is a place and African American people in general, African American teachers specifically, need to have a voice. And sometimes our voice is muted and our voice is marginalized. And so we have to deal with that. So I appreciate the context and the content of this book um, of Horace Tate to remind us that in spite of what the research has said, that Southern teachers, Southern educators during the time of Jim Crow, particularly around board, Brown versus Board of Education, there has been um, all kinds of things that have said that, that we did not fight for our rights, we did not participate, that black teachers, our elders, our ancestors did not fight, and they did. It was just a very curious situation. And their lives were literally at stake. It, it was not about, oh, if they, they didn't want to fight with the NAACP because of, of, um, of losing their jobs. If you're, well, I mean, we have to eat. So one, let's not act like people can just afford to lose their jobs. Let's start there. Um, but she was able to explain some very key things. And because Dr. Horace Tate, um, and I don't know if I mentioned this, he was also a Georgia senator for 16 years, which his daughter now holds that seat. Um, I wanted to throw that out. So Horace Tate did the pedagogy, which is what Dr. Walker was talking about. He did the pedagogy as well as the advocacy. So her book, she goes on, um, and I want to highlight um, some of the key things that she talked about. Um, for me, eldership and passing the torch, it is very important that we understand what our elders have done, what our, our ancestors have done with um, this work, and how 
we now play a part in it. No, we are not living in mandated, segregated schools. However, we are in what they call de facto segregated schools, meaning because of, of housing and because of other um, class and because of, of other isms and schisms, we find ourselves in predominantly black um, schools with predominantly black teachers, predominantly black children, and predominantly black neighborhoods. Um, and so we have to acknowledge what that looks like because class does play a role in this. Um, so I, I said in retelling what she said, there were some key things that she brought up. Invisible agency. She spoke highly of back pre-Brown, during Brown, and post-Brown, black teachers and educators had an invisible agency. There was a network where Southern teachers were connected through these teacher organizations and they were able to fight um, and do advocacy work to help black teachers get salaries, help, um, um, us get books, get school uh, buildings. There was an invisible network that was going on that many people were not privy to. And she talks about this. Um, there was um, the way the education was given to our students was taught. It was purposeful education. It was pedagogy because, of course, you have to go according to the state and the standards that's necessary. But we have to understand children, black children and brown children's place. Where is your place within this society? So we had to teach children, and, and she said this specifically, and I want you to sit with this as I've been sitting with this for a week. Teach children to cr uh, critique American democracy and become full citizens within this. So yes, we can teach, you know, why is it that when we talk about black people in education, we, we land on slavery, we land on victim, we land on abuse, oppression, and then we get to Martin Luther King, and then that's it. And, and we're not teaching our children that we are, we are people, we are a culture, we are a community, we are greater than. And our story was definitely interrupted with slavery. We were scholars and activists and artists and, and scientists and researchers. We were all these things before slavery happened. And post-slavery, we still are doing this. During slavery, we were still doing things. We just weren't getting credit for it. So how she talked about this story, um, she talked about the three A's that she said um, is very necessary, um, aspiration advocacy and access, aspiration and advocacy and access. She said before Brown, according to her research, the black educators and the black schools had aspiration. The teachers were able to encourage black children to do and to become anything. They spoke into them the hope for tomorrow, right? They advocated. There was advocacy where they advocated for their rights, for our children to get the best, to, be, um, to have what they needed. And what we wanted out of Brown, um, Dr. Walker said, what we wanted out of Brown was access. And that is questionable. Do we have it now? Did we ever get it? Well, her response was, we got what we got, what we wanted was an additive model, meaning we wanted to add to our children's aspirations and advocacy with access, with books, with buses, with salary, right? What we got was an exchange model. We had to give up. So we have some access, but we gave up a lot. We lost probably our voice, definitely our voice, in losing black teacher, um, black teacher organizations, because at that moment, um, black organizations had a choice, and, and I'll find the article that I read um, that she did the research on this. Black teacher organizations after um, Brown and, and integration happened, 
it did it wasn't integration it was either black teacher organizations completely dissolved or they were absorbed in white organizations and the absorbing means that our our needs are are um what we needed to be addressed was put on the back shelf and and this is where we land with muted and and marginalized our situations our issues things that were key to black teachers it is not all lives all lives do matter yes but we have to acknowledge that racist practices and racist systems make it where black lives and brown lives and women's lives there's some intersectionality of lives we have to acknowledge that oppressive systems marginalize and have the right to exclude people. And when exclusion happens, we have to yell and say, black lives matter, black teachers' lives matter, black children's education matters. We have to say that because we've been systematically excluded. Okay, so thinking about, I want to share, and, and I, I am, this is second no, secondhand knowledge. So I'm going to tell the story of how um, Dr. Walker, because her, her literary agent asked her to tell us the process of how she got to Dr. Horse Tate. And the story, I promise you I cried for the 30 minutes that she was telling the story, if not longer. And the other time I was definitely in the amen corner with my godmother. Um, who also is a, she just recently got her PhD, 70 years old. I mean, come on now. Um, so we, we had uh, our, what I called our Sunday afternoon of intellectualism when we went to the library and we sat um, in the presence of a scholar, right? Um, but she tells the story, um, her, her literary agents asked her to tell the story of how she landed on Dr. Horse Tate. So she was talking about how she'd been doing this research around segregated schools and what was really happening and why black teachers and black students have been, um, there are portions of the segregated schools that were very valuable that we lost. Um, and, and as a today teacher, as a 21st century teacher, yes, we have lost some major things um, so she talks about, many people had told her, you need to talk to Dr. Horst Tate. You need to talk to Dr. Horst Tate. And she wasn't trying to do it. You know, she was like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. So she talks about how this one day she finally gave in and said, you know what, I'm going to call him. And lo and behold, she calls him and he actually answers the phone. Problem number one. She was like, oh, wow, uh, right? And then she goes on to tell how this great man it was in his final years that he wanted to share this information that he had literally been saving for years. Um, during the merging of black teacher um, organization, the, the teachers union, during this time when, when the mergers were happening, black teacher files and the organizations, they were not only disbanding or merging, but a lot of their information was being destroyed. Um, and Dr. Tate was able to save this information for this day, for this moment. I'm so honored that she tells this story of how he, he really, I perceive, he tested her, right? So when he met her, she said that he, he, she went in and, she, and he asked her, like an elder would ask her, so tell me what you know. So she tells the parts that she had been researching and he said, yeah, that's half the story. I need you to look at this. And so every time they went, she went back, he mentored her. And every time he went, she went back, she gave, he gave her more information. He's like, okay, now look at this, now look at this. And she goes on to tell the story of how it was a period where she was meeting him in his office and he and his his main office and he's giving her information about the teachers union and what happened and whatnot. And then he moves to, well, I have another office, my home office, right? And so she gets the privilege 
Um, of course, after talking to his wife and they had to interview her basically, right? Like, is she going to be the one? Um, and so she goes to the home office for another mountain of information, his personal library, his personal artifacts and data um, collection as, as the secretary, the executive secretary, as the, the head of this organization, and, and the records that she was able to comb through. And he, he allowed her to see this and bring in a research team. And sidebar, for those moments, I was like, oh my God, I wanted to be on the research team, right? As I'm, as I'm again, trying to be a junior scholar and wanting to learn the process of, of researching and, and the ethics of doing it well and doing it honorably and doing it with, with respect to those um, those elders and those lives who who um, left this for us right to build on to know the story to wrestle with the stories and then to build on it how can we take this information so then she says of how um, right before he passed away she said that he um, he kept asking her did you go back to his other office the first office and she kept saying no she hadn't gone. And finally, when he transitioned, she had a conversation with her daughter, his daughter. And she was saying to the daughter, like, you know, I don't know why he wanted me to go back. You know, I thought I got all of the research that I needed to get there. And she was like, oh, I know why. You needed to go to the attic. Oh, my God. So she tells the story of how the daughter says you needed to go in his office, behind a door, then behind another door, then go down a hallway, then make a left and make a right and go down the steps and go up the steps and walk down the long hallway. They're going to go up some magic steps, right? And as she's telling this story, I'm getting goosebumps like thinking about it now. As she's telling this story, I am there. I see step by step everything she's telling like be careful going down the steps because the lights don't half work and watch out for the hole at the bottom of the steps like i'm feeling this moment and dr walker speaks about how she her um one of her researchers asked her well dr walker do you want me to go with you and she was like no i know that this is a part of my journey and the symbolism of that knowing that we have elders and ancestors that want to take us down a path and we don't even know what it is and we have to trust them because they've traveled this road before and we're trying to travel this road wow <laughs> we're trying to travel the road that they they went down and so as she's walking down the step i can see everything and she said she almost gave up because it was such a journey and a labyrinth of, you know, trying to get through this maze. And she said she, she almost gave up and she had to think about that song, that saying that says, I've come too far to turn back now. And I'm like, oh my God, it spoke so much to me, even why I'm, I'm, I'm crying now, right? But it spoke so much to me that we have to do work. This is not an easy work. This is not an easy job to learn what our elders went through for our moment. And how dare we give up and not pass it on and give it to the next generation. So she says when she finally gets to this attic, it was a hidden place where Dr. Horace Tate was able to hide for years, do you hear what I'm saying? Years, he was able to hide all of this data and, and artifacts of our teachers, what they were struggling with, their voices, the letters, the letters to the, the um, Thurgood Marshall, the letters to the NAACP, the letters to from parents, to teachers, from teachers to parents, and the network. And it was years of, of data. And I want to say, first of all, thank you to 
for, um, thank you to Dr. Um, Siddle Walker for taking the time, for going through this journey, for listening and being humble and going on anyhow. You know, and, and I want to share that as I'm talking to myself, as I'm struggling with urban education today, as I struggle sometimes, um, it hurts me what I see, how the institutions are in place to hurt not only our children, hurt our community, hurt our teachers, hurt our leaders. Who am I to give up? And I say this to you, who are you to give up? Who are we to, to be so high-minded to think that this is not work? You know, and it is. And even though we have a certain privilege, what I call a portion of privilege, we have a portion of privilege to, to go through these things, we still have to go through it. And we still have to fight. Um, and we still have to answer the call, are you down? for the struggle. So I want to encourage you. Um, I wanted, I had two other things that I wanted to say to think about. Just my final thoughts. Um, additionally, Malcolm X said, only a fool would let his enemy educate his children. Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I say that to say it is our responsibility to find the information, find the research, because some of the research is not going to be in the major or the majority, uh, majoritarian um, way, methods of knowing. You may or may not find the truth in, in some of your academic research. You might have to talk to some elders. You might have to find some, some biographies and, and critically read autobiographies and read these stories and hear what our elders have told us and what they've left for us. And, and, and sometimes they had to speak in code and we need to connect and reconnect with these codes. Um, so my question to you, my final thoughts, my question to you is how do we reconnect to our community networks. What does that connection look like? Does it look like podcasts? Does it look like social media? Does it look like meetings at the library or meetings in people's um, um, kitchens on Sunday afternoon? What does it look like? And who's at the table? And how diverse is the table? Is, is grandma at the table? Um, are the old teachers at the table? Are we reading? a range of scholarship, not just articles, not just research, but are we talking to people? We gotta get back to conversation. Um, so I hope that, you know, I was so excited to do this podcast um, with this particular topic, and I'll, I'll definitely leave some information at the bottom for you to do further study. Um, and I want you to leave answers to those questions. How can we reconnect? How can we diversify the table? And when I say diversify the table, I mean diversity within the community. So we are not only talking to educators, we're talking to parents, we're talking to activists, we're talking to homeschool teachers, we're talking to chartered schools because all charter schools, um, we have different layers. Like everything else is complexity within our community, our intersectionalities, that's the diversity. We're talking about male teachers, female teachers. We're talking about teachers of elementary school. We're talking about scholars and researchers at Ivy League schools, at HBCUs, and everything in between. How can we connect? How can we talk? Um, so I'm going to leave you here. I'm so glad you were here. I hope you share this podcast with your community of teachers, with your scholars, with your activists, with your parents. Um, anybody that is concerned and willing to do the work for black education and for the success of our students and our community, I, love to, I would love to hear from you. Follow me on Facebook, on Instagram, on Podomatic, on YouTube. Please leave your comments and your suggestions. Until we meet again, peace, power, and progress.